In the series Midnight Mass, directed by Mike Flanagan, the main character gives a monologue about her thoughts on what happens when we die. She says, It's like a drop of water falling back into the ocean, of which it's always been a part. All of us, a part. You and me, everyone who's ever been, every plant, every animal, every atom, every star, every galaxy, all of it. And that is what we're talking about when we say God, the one. The Stephen King-inspired show is clearly the result of Flanagan's own personal journey and thoughts on spirituality, and it could fill up an entire analysis by itself. But for the sake of this video essay, I think that monologue gets at the subject of what we're going to be talking about. In a word, I want to talk about individuality. In this video essay, we're going to think about the things that distinguish one person from another, and whether that's a good or a bad thing. The last year, three different perspectives led me to reflect more personally on individuality, as each voice offered a unique but helpful perspective. The first was an anime from the 90s called Neon Genesis Evangelion. It was described to me several years ago as a brilliant, intensely psychological show with religious themes. It also has giant robots fighting aliens. I finally got around to watching it this year and was surprised at how much it had in common with the second voice I was engaging with at the same time. You see, I was watching Evangelion while I was taking a class on a theologian from the third century named Origen. I'd always heard this early church father was condemned as a heretic, but I had also heard that he laid the groundwork for much of the Christian faith. I was never really able to actually engage with his writings until this last year, and while I certainly found some interesting things, I also was struck by his profound thoughts on individuality. And thirdly, I was engaging with those voices over Holy Week the time when Christians reflect on and celebrate Jesus' death and resurrection. This wasn't my first Easter, but I was provoked to appreciate the hope of Christ in a new way. I want to inform you, this video essay is going to dive into some deep and challenging reflections, but my hope is that the end will make it all worth it. While some or maybe even all of these subjects that I'm discussing might be unfamiliar to you, each of them are going to help us think about whether it's good or bad, that I'm me and you're you. Neon Genesis Evangelion follows a group of 13-year-old children who pilot giant mechs called Avas to fight giant aliens called angels. Even from just those two names, you can probably get a sense of how much the show loves to utilize Christian imagery. The three computers are called the Magi. References are made to Adam and a tree. A prophecy is called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Even explosions look like crosses. But the show's engagement with Christianity, in my mind, goes deeper than shallow references. While I certainly was engaging with the show's dynamic action sequences and iconic designs, for the first several episodes, I didn't quite understand what people kept raving about when it came to the psychological dimensions of the show. That is, until I got to In Sickness Unto Death. That episode hit me hard. Episode 16 takes its title, In Sickness Unto Death, from the Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, and it follows Evangelion's protagonist, Shinji, as he is trapped inside a pocket dimension by himself. He spends the entire episode floating in empty space, alone, contemplating his inner psyche and motivations. It's one of the first episodes we really spend time inside the character's head and watch him grapple with his insecurities. The setting of this episode really started to hit home to me the issues the show was dealing with. This boy is literally isolated from everybody else in a void where there is nobody to help or tell him what to do, no one to rely on, completely alone. At this point, it would be helpful for you to understand a central metaphor that the show uses, and one that this video essay is going to come back to over and over again. It's called the Hedgehog Dilemma. It's introduced early on in the show, and it sets the stage for every character's struggle and conflict in the rest of the show. It describes the dilemma that a cold hedgehog finds himself in when he tries to share warmth with other hedgehogs. On the one hand, he needs to huddle with other hedgehogs to stay warm. Otherwise, he'll freeze. On the other hand, hedgehogs have quills that pierce and hurt each other and keep them from wanting to huddle together. So the hedgehog is faced with either staying warm by being pierced and piercing others, or being on its own and freezing in the cold. And that is where Shinji found himself in this episode, completely alone in the world, 
freezing without the presence of others. In some ways, the robots themselves illustrate this idea. These giant mechs are being piloted by an inside person who cannot be seen. And that's kind of how life can feel like sometimes. Our bodies are what people see and interact with, but there's an inner self that's unknown to anybody else. And that can lead to something scary. The question, does anybody truly know me? I mean, you can't access my thoughts and I can't access yours other than what we disclose to each other. So how can I actually be known by anybody? How can I actually know anybody? Am I just like Shinji, floating in a void, unable to actually connect with or relate to anybody? Am I alone? An adolescent boy runs butt naked around his house, frantically searching for his clothes so he can go out. But his mother refuses to let him leave, so she's hidden all of his clothes to keep him inside. Why does this boy want to leave so badly? Well, the boy's father is to be martyred that day as a follower of Christ, and the child zealously wants to join him and become a martyr as well. Unable to find his clothes, the boy stays home and instead sends a letter to his father encouraging him not to change his mind on account of his family. This is the origin story we have of the zealous and controversial church father, Origen. A prolific writer, Origen helped shape the church in many ways, such as providing language to describe core beliefs like the Trinity and the incarnation of Christ. He lived in the second and third centuries, a time that saw everything through Greek dualism. In dualism, there are two worlds, the material and the spiritual. If you're familiar with Plato's ideas of things and shadows of things, you'll be familiar with this concept. The material, physical world is just a shadow of the real true world, which is spiritual and immaterial. This led to seeing physical matter as bad and spiritual things as good. The early church had to navigate these dualistic waters. How should a Christian think about material and spiritual things? Should we despise money? Is it wrong to enjoy physical things? The answer from many aesthetic Christians was to fully adopt the dualistic worldview, leading them to reject all physical pleasures and pursue spiritual things. Origen writes of these thinkers, but some suppose that all things should possess God and God should be all things to them, only if union with bodily nature in no way at all prevents them. Otherwise, if any intermingling with material substance were introduced, they reckoned that the glory of the highest blessedness would be impeded. One could argue that Origen himself was not unaffected by this teaching. In his writings, you can sense that the spiritual is seen as superior to the material. For example, you can see this in his spiritual interpretations of scripture, which he prioritized as more valuable than the material literal interpretations. In his commentary on the creation story of Genesis 1, Origen gives the following spiritual interpretation of the creation of the sun and moon. Just as the sun and moon are said to be great lights in the firmament of heaven, so also are Christ and the church in us. But since God also placed the stars in the firmament, let us see what are also stars in us that is, the heaven of our heart. Moses is a star in us, which shines and enlightens us by his acts. And Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, David, Daniel, and all to whom the Holy Scriptures testify that they pleased God. Origen was much less concerned with a material, literal reading of the text and much more interested in a higher spiritual understanding. This dualism in Origen's thought led to one particularly difficult belief called the pre-existence of souls. In discussions around origin, this usually comes up. In his writings, he describes a host of intelligent souls that God created who then descended into physical bodies through their bad choices. The impression this gives is that God created a bunch of immaterial souls who then by good or bad choices determined the kind of physical existence they would get. In other words, origin has often been understood as teaching that your soul existed before you were born and it fell into your body because of the moral choices it made. To be clear, that is not a Christian belief. Christians affirm that only the Trinity is eternal and that people are created. And so centuries after his life, Origen and his supposed teaching of pre-existence of souls was condemned by the church as heresy. It became unorthodox in both senses of the word. But 
how could this man who helped give the church its language to describe Christ's divine nature, as well as the categories to articulate the three and oneness of the Trinity, how could this man come to such a strange teaching? What was he trying to communicate with the pre-existence of souls, and what were his concerns in developing such an unorthodox belief? The week leading up to Easter is dynamic. It has movement to it. There is an end we are headed towards, and that end colors all the rest of the moments leading up to it. For example, Palm Sunday, when the people in Jerusalem rejoiced at the arrival of Jesus and cried, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is contrasted by that same crowd's rejection of Jesus only five days later when they cried, crucify him, crucify him. The end of the story shapes how we perceive the rest of it. Monday Thursday commemorates Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples, when Peter declares his undying loyalty to Christ. But this proclamation is tainted with the knowledge that not only Peter, but all of Jesus' disciples would abandon him in his time of need, only a few hours later. Good Friday marks that day when Jesus was sentenced to death and crucified on a hill. On that cross, he cried, Father, why have you forsaken me? He died rejected by the people he came to save. He died abandoned by the disciples he loved. He died forsaken by the father he served. Good Friday for Christians is a day of deep reflection. The service on this day is called the Tenebrae Service and it consists of meditating on the events of the cross in a room that progressively gets darker and darker as the lights are extinguished. While I have gone to many Good Friday and Easter services in my life, this was the first year that I experienced one on my own. This year, I was celebrating Holy Week in a foreign country, away from my family and closest friends. In some ways, I was able to relate to Jesus' isolation in a more intimate way than ever before. Keep in mind, this is the week that I was reading Origin. This was the week that I watched Neon Genesis Evangelion. I watched the episode in Sickness Unto Death when Shinji is isolated in a void the same night as the Tenebrae service, and the darkness in the room matched what I felt in my heart. I started to worry if the Christ I follow experienced such isolation in his death, am I doomed to the same fate? If even Jesus died alone, what hope could I have of overcoming the hedgehog dilemma Are we all cursed to never truly connect with anybody? The truth is, though, Good Friday is not the end of Holy Week. There's hope because Sunday is coming. Throughout Neon Genesis Evangelion, Shinji has struggled with meaningfully connecting with others. This is its theme, the Hedgehog Dilemma. Evangelion takes the literalization of this theme to an entirely different level from any show I've ever seen. In the show, the mechs have a force field to protect them in combat called an AT field. It prevents enemies from getting close enough to actually damage the robots. As the show continues, though, it's revealed that robots aren't the only one with AT fields. Every human in the show has an emotional AT field, an interpersonal barrier that keeps others from getting too close to them. The AT field isn't just a mechanic in fights. It's a representation of the way we put up barriers between each other. Think of a person's AT field as both what allows them to keep their individuality, to remain their own distinct person, and what keeps them also from establishing deep, meaningful relationships with others. But the literal manifestation of the show's theme gets even weirder. Throughout the series, a cabal of hidden figures discuss a mysterious plot in vague terms. Their plan? is to trigger something called an anti-AT field, disabling the AT fields of every human being on the planet. What does that mean? Well, since AT fields are the literal interpersonal barriers that separate us, the removal of those barriers is the removal of everything that keeps humans separate, both emotional and physical barriers. So in one of the most surreal, insane, and mind-bending sequences I have ever seen All of humanity loses individuality and is absorbed into a giant, swirling mass of unity. 
like I said, this part of the show is absolutely bonkers. But again, what's happening is that all barriers to unity are being removed, including our different physical bodies that keep us separate, like drops returning to the ocean. Every person loses their personal identity and is swallowed up into one single asteroid-sized being. It's not even an amalgamation of souls, because the whole point is that all diversity, all plurality, anything that keeps people apart and distinguishes one from another is gone. And the question is put to the viewer's mind, is this what we want? Is this our hope? Is this the answer to the hedgehog dilemma? Humanity becoming a single non-physical entity where there are no individuals? Origen's peculiar teaching that led to the accusation of believing in pre-existent souls is closely tied to his understanding of matter and diversity. You see, matter and diversity were closely tied together, which makes sense. I think of diversity in terms of the different bodies and experiences people are born to. Some are born rich, others poor, some healthy, others sick, some to loving parents, others to cruel parents. This diversity in many ways is rooted in our physical existence. One person is different from another because they have different physical bodies. I am different from you because I have experienced my life through my body and you through yours. Matter has led to diversity. Finally, when the world needed variety and diversity, matter offered itself with all docility throughout the diverse appearances and species of things to the maker as to its Lord and creator, and that he might bring forth from it the diverse forms of heavenly and earthly things. But when the things have begun to hasten towards that end, that they all may be one as the Father is one with the Son, it may rationally be understood that where all are one, there will no longer be diversity. But if matter is associated with diversity and matter is seen as bad in dualism, then the logical conclusion is that diversity is bad. I mean, one of the reasons material is considered inferior to the spiritual is the way that it divides unlike the spiritual which unites. God is one, totally unified with himself. Spiritual and godly things bring unity, while matter and physicality bring diversity. At the risk of oversimplifying things, it, it could be understood like this. God is good, and God is unified in spirit. Therefore, unity in spirit is good. Also, matter is bad. Creatures are diverse because of matter. Therefore, physical diversity is bad. And now we have the building blocks of how Origen got to the pre-existence of souls. He's asking the question, how could a good, spiritually unified God create bad physical diversity? The pre-existence of souls resolves this dilemma by attributing the diversity of the world to creatures' decisions, rather than God's. In this thinking, God created non-physical souls who, by their own decisions, fell into physical diversity. It's not God's fault at all, Origen says. And if the diversity of the material world is bad, then the ultimate hope is that this diversity would be dissolved. God began the world in unity, and he's directing all things back to this unity. The phrase Origen uses is from 1 Corinthians 15, 28. God will be all and in all. The end, the hope of Christ's work in the world is to bring all things back into unity with God so that God will be all and in all. Now, if unity is associated with the spirit and diversity with matter, then the idea of a final unity with God could be understood as the destruction of the physical world the destruction of the body in order to return to a non-material spiritual unity in which all things are literally one. Diversity, individuality, is dissolved into a homogenous entity. Finally, our flesh is considered to be so destroyed after death such that it is believed to have no remnant at all of its former substance. And into this condition then, it must be supposed that this entire bodily substance of ours will be brought when all things will be restored, when they shall be one, and when God shall be all in all. And we are similarly left asking the question, is this what we want? Is this our hope? Is this the answer to the hedgehog dilemma? Humanity becoming a single non-physical entity where there are no individuals?
Is being your own person really such a bad thing? Is connecting with others worth losing what makes you, you? In the end, neither Shinji nor Origin affirm this hope. They both reject this vision as misplaced and misguided. In Evangelion, Shinji enters the planetary mass of human souls and is given a choice. If he would like, he could join the body of unity. He would lose his personal identity, but in so doing would overcome the hedgehog dilemma that he's been struggling with throughout the entire show. He would, in a sense, be removing his quills in order to join the warmth of the huddle without fear of getting hurt or hurting others. He would be able to love others and be loved. Of course, there would cease to be any other because everyone would be a single entity and so the love would be self-love. Instead, Shinji chooses to return to his physical form. He rejects the body of unity, rejects losing his identity. Shinji's choice in the TV series is presented as noble, one which is cause for celebration. In fact, after he chooses to accept himself as a person, all the characters in the show rejoice with a sequence of each telling Shinji, congratulations. He's able to confidently declare, I'm me. I want to be myself. I want to be here. He's accepted himself as his own unique person and decided that individuality is not worth losing. Unfortunately, this puts Shinji right back where he was at the beginning. While he has learned to accept himself, it is at the cost of community and connection with others. He's chosen to keep his quills, in a sense. Although he has affirmed the importance of remaining his own person, he has not overcome the hedgehog dilemma. He's right back to where he started. The hope the show provides is summarized by one of Shinji's final comments. Maybe I can learn to love myself. Neon Genesis Evangelion as a series is right in affirming individuality. It just doesn't provide an alternative hope beyond accepting oneself. Unfortunately, self-acceptance on its own will not solve the hedgehog dilemma. Origin has explained how some teach that matter is so inferior to the spiritual that its ultimate end will be destruction in order for a non-physical unity to be achieved one where the individual entity of each person is lost. While he agrees that the spiritual body will be far superior to our current one, Origen rejects the notion that this means matter will be completely destroyed. He explains that God created the physical body, and if God created something, it must be good in some way. God does not create bad things. Instead of hoping in the destruction of the body, Origen looked to the resurrection of the body for hope. If Christ's resurrection was only the first fruits, and he didn't cease to have a body after the resurrection, neither will our bodies be destroyed in that final resurrection. A physical resurrection means God affirms our individuality. We will be unified, but not as disembodied souls. I still remain me. God being all in all is not a statement about the disillusion of the individual. It's an elevation of the individual. You become a new you in Christ. Consider for a moment an iron in the fire. While the iron is consumed with the fire, it never ceases to be iron, but it is defined by the properties of the fire. Heat, light, fluidity. In the same way, the individual in Christ retains their own identity, but now they are consumed with the properties of God. Perhaps a more helpful description of this individuality might be found from a more recent Christian writer. The 19th century reformed theologian Herman Bavinck writes, even individuality is not thereby destroyed because it is not an imperfection, but that which supplies the essence of each person and distinguishes one from the other. Without that individuality, an organism would not even be able to exist. The kingdom of God would cease being the most perfect, the most pure organism if the hand were no longer the hand, the eye no longer the eye, and each member of that organism were no longer itself. If all were a single member, where would the body be? In this video essay, I've essentially broken the hedgehog dilemma into two questions. Can I ever truly connect with and be known to another person? And must I lose my individuality to find community and unity? I would argue that neither Midnight Mass's solution nor Neon Genesis Evangelion's is ultimately satisfying, and only in Christ is the dilemma resolved. The solution in Mike Flanagan's Midnight Mass is to abandon individuality for the sake of unity. 
The solution found in Neon Genesis Evangelion is self-acceptance at the cost of community. But Christ offers a third way in which unity and individuality are maintained. To the first question, when you are in Christ, he is with you. He knows you. You are not alone. He knows your thoughts, your fears, your pains, your desires. You are known fully. Even further, you have a heavenly father who put you here, just like in Evangelion. But unlike Shinji, your creator loves you. We have a heavenly father who can empower us to love our enemies. You're not alone because God is loving you and can love through you. On Easter weekend, I reflected on the hedgehog dilemma, Christ's isolation, and my own solitude. I had said earlier that on Good Friday, I resonated with the loneliness of Christ in a new way. Well, on Easter this year, I rejoiced in the hope of his resurrection with renewed appreciation. In Christ's death on the cross, we see the hedgehog dilemma at its deadliest. It not only pokes, it pierces to death. But in Christ's resurrection from the tomb, we see the only sufficient hope to overcome the hedgehog dilemma. The one who was pierced for our sake has made a way to enjoy the warmth of the huddle without losing our identity. To answer the second question, we don't need to choose between individuality and community. In Christ, his resurrection means my body is a part of God's plan and it's not going to be destroyed. Individuality is not a disease to be cured. Christ's resurrection means God actually cares about me as an individual, not just as a drop in the ocean. I'm loved as my own person. My uniqueness is not an imperfection that needs to be removed. It's a vital component of my position in the body of Christ. I can accept myself and you can accept yourself, not because we're flawless and don't have any quills, but because Christ has loved us and can soften our quills. With Christ's solution, I can modify Shinji's words from one of self-acceptance, I want to be me, to one of Christocentric renewal. I want to be who Christ is making me. I've got no You belong